Uh, we've got some special music for you guys, so I'm going to invite up uh, Candy and Trudy. So let's give a hand for Candy and Trudy as they come. Um, okay, yeah, so before this song begins, um, I wrote this song after I got baptized. Um, I got baptized in December. And previously I'd come from a world where everyone around me and myself included had a warped perception of what love was. Um, we confused love for lust and really just didn't have an understanding of what true love was because we didn't have an understanding of Jesus. Um, and so when Jesus freed me from that, um, it's just like he opened my eyes to a whole new world um, of understanding and of what love was. And yeah, this song just felt natural. It just came from that. So I hope you enjoy it. This sounds great, by the way, but it's not ours. This, I really like that song. Yeah. Leaving the life went easy, got comfortable in sin and the devil deceived me For if I came to the Father would he even receive me If I said I was sorry would he even believe me But, but he freed me from the bondage and confusion, the stress and delusions And things I kept hidden inside from the heartbreak and the pain From the guilt and the shame And all the silent tears that I cried Yeah, cause if the sun sets you free You, you will be, be free indeed. indeed And in the quiet of the night See, I fell to my knees Cause of the mercy of the Lord I was in dire need Crying, Jesus, speak to me Because I'm listening Please just show me your truth And I will live in it And from that very moment I was sure, see, I surrendered it all So I know that this is This is love, this is love, this is love This is love, this is love, this is love Help me to seek your face, speak your way Be where you place me Allow your spirit to change me Cause I've been stumbling, falling, battling fights But it's your name I'm calling Your name I'm pressing on I don't need no one else But the devil stay trying me Cause it's been seven to eight years Since I found you I cried a thousand tears But you proved Your love for me by setting me free And now I'm no longer chained You know That you helped me grow But not on my own You never leave forsaken now I know that This is love, this is love, this is love You never leave forsaken now I know that yeah, yeah. This is love, this is love, this is love oh. This is love, this is love, this is love This is love, this is love, this is love
Very, very good. Very good ministry. Made me want to jump in. Do a little quick 16. <laughs> um, you know, just as I'm listening to, to Trudy testify or speak about what inspired her for this song, it made me think about, you know, just us in life or as a Christian, should I even say, we have good times, right? Yeah, we have brilliant moments. We have good times as a Christian, but we also have moments where they're really dry. You know, moments where it's like, hi, this is a difficult season or like I'm struggling through, you know. And as I'm thinking, as I'm pondering on this thought about having good times and having dry seasons or having moments where you're going to have to really push through. It made me think of this scripture that we're going to read here today from Proverbs 27, 17. So if you have your Bibles, Proverbs 27, 17. And as I'm thinking, as I'm pondering on this scripture, as I'm looking at it, my first thought is, you know what? I need to start sharpening myself. I need to start uh, gaining some accountability from other people, from people that, um, that I can really speak to, that I can get down and dirty in my conversation with and tell them, hey, you know what? This is what I'm struggling through. This is what I'm going through. I need you to help me. How do I find direction? Because we all go through seasons like this, church, don't we? We all go through seasons where we're saying to ourselves, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next week. I don't know if I'm going to even make it to church on Sunday. But what I do know is I have a friend that I can call. I have someone that I can get in contact with to tell them, hey, I'm struggling. Hey, I'm going through situations. Can you help me? Can you direct me? So we're going to read here today from Proverbs 27, 17. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Let's pray together, church. Father, I thank you, Jesus, for all that you're going to do, God, in this place. Lord, I thank you for uh, this, this time, God, that we could gather together and, and uh, really dive into your word. Lord, I pray that you would speak a word in season to your saints. God, help us to not leave the same way we came in. God, we want to leave edified by your word. We want to leave transformed and empowered, oh God. Lord, let us leave in the victory. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Life is going to have battles, though, church. We are going to go through battles. And what God desires for our life, most importantly, is to use it. He desires to use your life. Turn to your neighbor, say, God. Oh, that weren't convincing, church. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend that never happened, yeah? We're going to start again. We're going to start again. Turn to your neighbor, say, God desires to use your life. And that's the most important thing that we have to remember. God desires to use your life. You know, when you get saved, there is something that God does to say, hey, you know what? I want to use this person's life. I want to do something supernatural. I want to do something powerful in this person's life. I remember when I got saved, we, we used to go on impact teams here, there, and everywhere. Uh, we went on an impact team to, to Holland. And as we're there on an impact, this is my first international impact team. So I'm there and I'm speaking to people. Some people are not understanding me. They say, no, speak English, da, 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 da. So as I'm there, I'm speaking to them. And, I'm and as uh, I've left the conversation, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, Kai, this is powerful. That I can carry the gospel, that God will use my life to carry the gospel to another nation, to people that I can't even relate to. They have no, there's, there's no similarities in their backgrounds, but God is still using my life to try and reach these people, to speak the gospel to these people. God can use your life for something. God wants to use your life for something. But as we go through our life in salvation, there are going to be moments, as I spoke about, where we're going to go through battles, where uh, we might walk and we might stumble and we might walk and we might say to ourselves, you know, what's going on? What's happening in my life? Hey, the reality is you've gone through battles. 
The reality is you're going through battles. You're going through moments where you have to go through the ebb and flows. You're going through moments where you have to go down deep in the valley for you to get yourself out of as well. Our text, it speaks about sharpening. And it mentions this word sharpening twice because it wants to help us understand that, hey, church, we have to be sharpened. For us to go through life, uh, for us to be successful and to be used uh, appropriately, we have to be sharp. We have to be sharpened, especially when it comes to the kingdom of God. Matthew eleven twelve it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The reason why the violent take it by force is because we're in a battle. The reason why we have to go out and we have to preach the gospel and we have to declare and we have to stand and break strongholds is because there is a battle going on. There is a battle that's out there and the devil doesn't like the fact that you're praising Jesus. The devil doesn't like the fact that you're, you're coming to church. The devil doesn't like the fact that you're hearing truth and that things in your life are changing. There is a battle that's going on. And even if we don't see it for face value, there's even a battle that's going on inside of us. There's a battle that's happening whether we should go left or right, whether we should hear or whether we should just do our own thing. There's a battle that's happening. In Ephesians 6.12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, of wickedness in heavenly places. There is a battle that's going on, but with battles comes battle fatigue. But with battles comes moments where we say to ourselves, I don't know how I'm going to respond. When battle fatigue kicks in, you know, you're, you're, you're likely to make decisions that you won't make when you're okay. You're likely to make decisions that you won't make when things are going good. You're going to be making decisions where you're going to look back and you're going to say, why did I do that? Why did I say this? But the reality is sometimes we'll go through battles and we'll get tired. Our flesh begins to take over. Galatians 5.17, it says the flesh lusts against the spirit. There is a war that's happening even within ourselves, as I said, you know, where our flesh is fighting our spirit, where our flesh is saying, no, you've got to go this way because you desire to do that, don't you? And we see this example after example in the scripture. David himself went through many different battles with his flesh. And he even says in Psalms uh, 32, 3, he says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the days long. And this is when David is, is, has come out now where, and that he's had this affair with Bathsheba. And uh, now he, he's writing about it in the book of Psalms and he's saying, Hey, you know what? When I kept this silent, things inside of me weren't going too well. My bones even were growing old. There is, a physical, uh, there is a physical transformation that happens when we keep things inside. There's a physical transformation that takes place when we don't confess, when we don't say this is right or this is wrong, when we don't submit to the things that God wants us to submit to. There are different areas of our life where we hold back and we say to ourselves, God, I can give you this specific area. God, I want to give you this area, but this area that I have, this area that's really dear to me, I can't give it. I don't want to hold back. Don't want to let go. I just want to keep this specific thing in me. You can have everything else, God. There are even relationships that we have relationships that we go through, friendships even. Our text speaks about friendships. But hey, the reality is you might have a, a friend, you might have someone that's very close to you, but you might even have uh, some, some, some sort of disagreement, some sort of conflict with this friend. But it doesn't mean that, uh, th that the relationship is over. It doesn't mean that this person is wrong or this person doesn't like you. But the reality is you have to sometimes choose righteousness over relationship. And sometimes truth hurts. So if the person has told you truth and you found it hard to receive, hey, it's because they love you. 
It's not because they want to see you perish, but it's because they desire to see you grow. They desire to see you make it in the kingdom. That's why we choose righteousness over relationship. That's why people shouldn't be bitter when it comes to truth being thrown at you. That's why people should be willing to forgive as Jesus even says, hey, we should be willing to forgive if we desire to receive forgiveness from God as well. See, the enemy comes and he throws different things, different spanners in our work, in our Christian life. You know, and we might say to ourselves, you know what, I've prepared in the best way, but there are things that we just can't prepare for. There are things that come in the way and we don't know it's coming. There are corners that we have to turn and we don't know what's at that corner. But all we know is that God is in control, right? Amen. We know that God is in control and God wants us to encourage each other. And that's why he tells us, that's why he encourages us to sharpen each other. That's why he encourages us to go through life and, and, and not be blunt, but to sharpen each other. Because there's a cutting edge that we need when it comes to the battles of life. You know, there are some people in life that are just sharper than others. You know, when, when COVID hit, I'm not going to lie, that was probably the best season for me. I was able to sleep as long as I wanted to. <laughs> I was able to just relax and not do anything and not worry. You know, but there are some people, as soon as COVID hit, they, they knew how to operate. They knew what they wanted to do. Hey, you know what? At this time, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go and work out outside. At this time, I'm going to take, take on some reading. At this time, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. There are some people that just have that personality, that get up and go personality. And there are some people that just want to chill and just want to sit back and relax. But over course of time, Though if you're a certain person that wants to relax or if you're a get up and go sort of person, you know, re realistically over time, your cutting edge is going to be blunt. There are going to be battles that you will face. Whether you want, to, whether you like it or not, whether you choose the path of least resistance, there's going to be battles you're going to face. And when those battles come, are you going to be sharp enough? Are you going to be ready? Are you going to, have you, are you going to be prepared for what's to come? Are you prepared at the moment when that turn comes, when that corner comes? 1 Samuel 13, 19, it says, Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Least the Hebrews make swords or spears, but all the Israelites would not go, would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. Here, the Israelites, they weren't prepared. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, he already had his plan at the very beginning. He said, hey, I'm going to take away all the blacksmiths so that Israelites would have to come to us so that they can sharpen. You know, we have to be prepared so that whenever a time comes for us to go to battle, whenever a time comes for us to go out and start fighting, we have to be prepared. We have to tell ourselves, I've got to sharpen in this area. I've got to be ready to sharpen in this area because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's to come around the corner, but I know that there is a battle to come. I know that there is a valley that I have to go through to get to the top of the mountain. I know that there are things that I have to do for me to get to where I desire to get to. And that's why we have to sharpen our cutting edge, church. That's why we can't be dull when it comes to the seasons of life or the good seasons, should I even say, of life. You know, there are seasons that we go through. There are moments where we don't even realize ourselves that we're going through hardship. You know, we can come up to church and we can even say to ourselves, you know, I feel good. We can convince everybody else around us. But there's always that one friend that will say, are you sure you're okay? There's always that one person that will say, hey, you know what, come just sit down and let's pray together. And that's why we, that's why the, the Bible encourages us to sharpen each other, because we have to be that person for our brother and sister. We have to be that person to look around and see, hey, you know what? That person's not moving okay. 
That person would sometimes be walking around church, seeing how everybody else is doing, but now they're just sitting down. We have to be that person to notify or to see, should I even say, the small things. The small things are, are things that can make a massive difference in someone's life. Someone once said that uh, to, start, to start a wildfire, it doesn't take uh, it doesn't take a hundred matches, it only takes one. I've experienced things in ministry myself, where I've gone through ups and downs, where I, I've gone through seasons. I'm not too sure if I've shared this but um, with you guys, but in 2020, I, I lost my dad just after COVID. And at that moment in that season, that was probably the most difficult season of my life, where I, I didn't know you know, what was to come. I, I, I genuinely had a, a deep anxiety because I've heard many stories of, hey, when, when someone's parent passes away, that the other parent is, is, is soon going to follow after. I've heard many of those sort of sayings. I've heard many of those stories. So there in me, I'm, I'm having this sort of anxiety. Hey, you know, my mom is going to pass away very shortly. That was probably the most difficult season of my life. And then I get a phone call just randomly from uh, Pastor Lewis Avellino. I'll give him a shout out, actually. And he calls me, he says, hey, you know what, just come round my house. And I'm there and I'm just relaying, I'm saying everything that's going on, everything that's transpiring. And this is because he understood that this is a friend that needs sharpening. He didn't see exactly what was happening in my mind. He didn't know what was going on, but he understood that here's a friend that needs sharpening. Can you see a friend? Can you see someone that needs sharpening? Is there someone in your life where you might say, hey, this person isn't acting right, or hey, this person is going through things. I need to help them. I need to at least reach out and say, how are you doing? I need to at least reach out and say, my brother, my sister, I'm praying for you. Because people's lives will get blunt. People don't even see sometimes. So let's uh, continue. In Matthew 22, 22, 37 to 40, it says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws. See, salvation isn't just a, 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 a vertical thing. Salvation is about the person that sits next to you too. When you get saved, you know, you don't just invite Jesus into your life, but you invite people into your life as well. You invite your, your, your church into your life as well. And as they're in your life, you're the person that's responsible for making sure that that person make it, makes it to heaven as well. You're the person that's responsible to say, hey, you know what, my friend, my brother, my sister, we've got to push on, we've got to carry on because there's another battle that's coming. We've got to sharpen each other because there are things in our wake, there are things that are happening that we have to push past as well got to be able to seek and see people around you as well because they're the people that are going to be very pivotal in your salvation. Abraham Lincoln once said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first hour sharpening the axe. He understood that there's a very good principle to life here and it's about preparing. It's not about how hard you swing but it's about how sharp your blood, your knife or your sword is. It's about using the wisdom to bring success. It's not always about the brute force, but it's about how can I uh, shrewdly make decisions? How can I make the right choices? How am I making uh, judgments in life? Because our sh uh, us sharpening our edge is us having the ability to deal with different obstacles of life. It's having the ability to look past uh, the things that we see, to look past the relationships or the dilemmas that are in front of us and say, God, I'm going to continue to chase after you. God, I'm going to continue to push past all these things that are in my wake. Countenance. So, as a, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends, the scripture says. This word countenance 
it, it also means, or another translation, it says the character of his friend. You know, as you speak, as you speak into your friend, you're expecting things to turn around. As your, you, as your friend is speaking to you, you should be turning things around. Things should be heading in a different direction. You shouldn't be looking or you shouldn't be doing exactly the same thing or exactly opposite that your friend should be saying to you. But it should be a response that should take place. It should be something that you would say to yourself, you know what, they've spoken good words because they've spoken out of love. They've spoken good words and I understand where they're coming from. I understand that it's not a dig at me, but it's because they desire to see what's good for me. There's no substitute for church, man. There's no substitute. When we come into this building, when we come uh, and, and in the gathering of, 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 of each and every single one of us, there's no substitute for that. And that's why the Bible even encourages us not to forsake the gathering of the saints. Because God puts people in your life to sharpen you. He puts people in your life so that you can gain wisdom from them. And so that they can also gain wisdom from you. And time and time again, people would say to themselves, you know, what? I don't need church. I don't need to go to church because of X, Y, and Z, because all the same people are in church, all this and that about church. But the reality is church is where you find true freedom. Church is where you find real direction. Church is where you understand what a Christian is meant to be like. Hey, you know what the re I think I, I, I caught up some, I caught something. When I come to church, you know, most times people can rub me the wrong way. Most times people can say things and, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't sit well with my soul. That's probably the best way of saying it. It doesn't sit well with me, but the reality is I, I've got to learn how to respond to that. And that's where your Christianity is tested in how you respond to those sort of situations, how you respond to things that are not quite the way that you thought it would be in church. That's where your Christianity is tested. That's where you can say, you know what, I'm, a, I'm, I'm actually a Christian because I responded the right way. So let's uh, end with, with four things, four things that you can, four ways, should I even say, that you can care for a friend. The first way is challenge. You can challenge your friend to grow spiritually. Challenge them in a sense to say, hey, you know what, this is, this is going to help you. This is how you end up becoming a better Christian. If you continue to head that direction, it's not going to end well. You've got to be able to challenge your friend. You've got to allow your friend to challenge you as well. You open that door for them to come in. Second thing is affirm. Affirming is, is, simply, is simply as just calling or texting them and saying, hey, you know what, you're doing a good job. You're doing great as a Christian. Keep doing what you're doing, encouraging them to push forward. Encouraging them to push, encouraging them to do all that they can to get to that place. Uh, third thing is respect. Respecting each other, respecting each other's wishes and not uh, breaking or, or not uh, overstepping the mark. Not, not saying to the, your friend or to your neighbor, hey, you know what, like certain things that you said or done and it's been five years and you're, and you're still bringing it up and you're still saying, hey, you know what, five years ago, you hurt me, you're overstepping the mark. That's disrespectful. And then lastly, you know, continue to bring confidence to their life. Continue to encourage them through your life, bringing confidence. Hey, you know what? If my purse, if my friend can do it, then so can I. It's about how you respond. It's about how you act because when you act the right way and they see that you act the right way, then hey, it can be a, a, a launching pad for their life as well to say, hey, if they can do it, then so can I. If they can push past, then so can I. If they can be a Christian for X amount of years, then so can I. If they're able to go and speak the gospel, if they're able to, to bring people to church, then so can I. 
If they're able to make it to morning prayer, then so can I. If they're able to read their Bible and, and get revelation from God, then so can I. Just as I close, uh, I'm just going to end with this story. There was a story of these two friends that, uh, that fought in the World War I. And they were inseparable. They enlisted in the army together. And they trained together and they were shipped out uh, to, to overseas together as well. They fought side by side. And in the trenches, as, as they're being attacked, one of the men, he was critically wounded in a field and filled with barbed wires and obstacles. And he was unable to get to. And as the whole crew, they crawled back into the trenches, his friend is there, he's screaming out, he's trying to scream for someone to come and help him. And as he's withering away, the enemy is there, they're fighting, they're shooting. And his friend says, I've got to go out to my friend, I've got to try and help him. So he goes out and as he's just about to head out of the trenches, he's pulled back in by his commander. His commander says, you can't go out there. I order you not to go out there. And just as his commander turned around, he shot out out of the trenches. He went to grab his friend. And as he's running back, he's getting shot as well. He's now wounded. And as he dropped his friend, and as he's there, he's lying there, and he's about to die. Commander says, I told you not to go out there. You should have left him. And he's, he says with one of his last breaths, or his dying breath, should I even say, I made the right decision. Because as I picked him up, he said, I knew you'd come back for me, Jim. I knew you'd come back for me. If you see someone out there and they're dying out, if you see a friend, should I even say, and they're dying on the battlefield, because we, we're, we're in a battlefield. If you see a friend and they're dying on the battlefield, would you go back after them? Are you the one to, to go back after them? Are you the one that's going to pick them up? And they said, I knew you'd come for me. I knew you'd encourage me in my time of weakness. Are you that one? Are you that friend? Because we go through battles. We go through difficulty. We go through hardship. But we need just the one friend to help us out. We need just the one friend to help us through, to help us to push past. It's a sacrificial love, amen, Carrie. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that's going, that, that's going to cost. It's a love that's going to hurt sometimes. It's a love that, may say, that you may say to yourself, this is going to wound me very, very deeply. But when we look at the cross, when we look at Jesus, that was a love that was sacrificial too. That was a love that said, this is going to cost. Because the scripture says, even while we were still sinners, Christ still died for us. There was a sacrifice that was made with the hope that people would turn, with the hope that people would come back to God, would come back to Jesus. With that, can every head bowed and every eye closed, just in respect to God, in respect to a neighbor. Just every head bowed and every eye closed. Oh, I just need a friend. I just need a friend to sharpen me. I just need someone to come. Now, that may be your shout here today. I just need someone. I just need. But before we even get to that place, God just needs something from you. Jesus just needs something to happen in your life. Because what's transpired is why Jesus died on the cross, why he showed that sacrificial love is because of something in our life called sin. Something that has separated us from God. God says, hey, I, I love you so much. That's why I've done what I've done. 
-hmm. Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. He done this because he desires to mm -hmm. see you make it. Desires to see something better for you. Desires to be your friend. To sharpen you in life. And as you're here today, you may not know Jesus. You don't know God. You don't have a relationship with him. But in your heart, you're saying, I think I, I, I need to begin this relationship need to start something here something needs to change something needs to transpire something needs to happen this is where jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and he's saying all you have to do is just let me in just let me in as our heads are bowed our eyes are closed i'm just gonna give a, a quick opportunity you don't know Jesus, you don't know God, but you want to, you want to accept him inside your life here today. Lord and personal Savior, just simply lift up your hand and then slip it back down. That's me here today. I want to accept Jesus inside my life. Amen. I see that hand, my sister, you can put it down. Is there anybody else? Anybody else here today who want to accept Jesus? So my life was my Lord and personal Savior. Just simply lift up your hand and then slip it back down. Sin, I, I've done wrong. I want to make things right again. Simply just lift up your hand and then slip it back down. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you once served Jesus. You once served God. Things have transpired. Things have happened along the way. And now you're saying, you know what? I just want to come back home. I'm ready to come back. I'm done fighting. I'm done running from God. I'm ready to come back. Just simply just lift up your hand and then slip it back down. That's you here today. Just simply lift it up and then slip it back down. That's me. Backslidden. Not saved born again but I want to be just simply lift up your hand and then slip it back down amen as our heads are bowed our eyes are closed my sister that lifted up her hand if you just look up at me I believe you meant that you know you're going to make a great decision today. I want to encourage you just come forward a sister's going to come and pray with you here at this altar as well feel free to come free great decision sister's going to come pray with you in church we need to sharpen our cutting edge but we also need to help our brothers help our sisters have we been watchful we've been keeping our eyes open have we been seeing the small things that haven't been quite right things that God has spoken to you about here today you're saying, you know what, God, something needs to change. Something needs to happen. Maybe God has spoken to you about something, something else, something different. And you want to take some time to pray. Feel free. Let's come. Let's lay hold of God here at this altar. We want to pray and ask Jesus to help us here. Feel free to come. The altars are open. Thank you. 